The Paulicans were a Christian sect that flourished between 650 and 872 in Armenia. According to medieval Byzantine sources, the group's name was derived from a 3rd century bishop of Antioch. The sources show that most Paulican leaders were Armenians. The founder of the sect is said to have been an Armenian by the name of Constantine. He studied the Gospels and combined dualistic and Christian doctrines, vigorously opposed the formation of the church. Regarding himself as having been called to restore the pure Christian, he adopted the name Silvanus, and about 660 he founded his first congregation in Armenia. 27 years later, he was arrested by the imperial authorities, tried for heresy and stoned to death. Constantine's successor was burned to death in 1690. The adherents of this sect fled, with Paul at their head. He died in 715, leaving two sons. His successor's death in 745 was the occasion of a division in the sect, Zacharias and Joseph being the leaders of the two parties. The latter had the larger following and was succeeded by the Bainis in 775. The sect grew in spite of persecution. The Paulicans were now divided into Bainites and the Sergites. At the same time the Sergites fought against their rivals and nearly executed them. Bains was supplanted by Sergius. In 801, the control of the sect was divided between several leaders. The Empress Theodora, as regent to her son Michael III, instituted the persecution against the Paulicans throughout Asia Minor, in which 100,000 Paulicans in Byzantine, Armenia, are said to have lost their lives and all of their property and lands were confiscated by the Empire. In 871, the Emperor Basil I ended the power of the state of the Paulicans, and the survivors fled to the east of the Byzantine Arab border. In 970, 200,000 Paulicans were transferred by the Emperor from Armenia to Thrace as a reward for their promise to keep back the Scythians. The Emperor granted them religious freedom. This was the beginning of the revival of the sect, Several thousand went into the army. When the Crusaders took Constantinople in the Fourth Crusade, 1204, they found some Paulicans, whom the historian Godfried calls Popelicans. According to the historian Jordan Ivanov, some of the Paulicans were converted to Orthodoxy and Islam and the rest to the Catholic faith during the 16th and 17th century. At the end of the 17th century, the Paulicans people still living around Nicopol, Bulgaria, and persecuted by the Ottoman Empire after the uprising in 1688, and a good part of them fled across the Danube and settled in the Banat region. There are still over 10,000 Banat Bulgarians in Romania today, with a few in Arad. However, they no longer practice their religion since they converted to Roman Catholicism. Their folklore is specific about Bulgaria's liberation from the Ottoman rule in 1878. A number of Banat Bulgarians resettled in the northern part of Bulgaria and still reside there today. In 
In Russia, after the war of 1828-29, to Pauluckan communities could still be found in the part of Armenia occupied by the Russians. Documents of their professions of faith, Connie Bear based his depiction of the Paulicans as simple, godly folk who had kept an earlier form of Christianity. The Paulicans accepted many parts of Christianity. They believed that Christ came down from heaven to emancipate humans from the body and from the world. The reverence from the cross they look upon as heathenish. Their places of worship they called places of prayer. They also practiced marriage. People regard the Paulicans as the forerunners of the Cathars. The Paulicans were branded as Jews, Mohammedans, Aryans, Manicheans. It is likely that their opponents called them these terms of abuse. They call themselves Christians or true believers. Some people accuse the Cathars of Arianism. Some scholars see Cathar Christology as having traces of earlier Arian roots. According to some of their contemporary enemies, did not accept the normal understanding of Jesus, but considered him the human form of an angel. Some people compare the Cathars to Western Buddhists, because their view of the doctrine of resurrection taught by Jesus was in fact similar to the Buddhist doctrine of reincarnation. The Cathars taught that, to regain angelic status, one had to renounce the material self completely. Until one was prepared to do so, he or she would be stuck in a cycle of reincarnation, condemned to live on a corrupt earth. Killing was also abhorrent but to the Cathars. They sustained from all animal food, sometimes eating fish. They avoided anything considered to be a byproduct of sexual reproduction. War and capital punishment were also condemned. In a world where few could read, their rejection of oath-taking marked them as social outcasts. Cafarism has been seen as giving women the greatest opportunities for independent action since women were found to be believers as well as perfecti. Cathars believed that one could be repeatedly reincarnated until one commits to the self-denial of the material world. A man could be reincarnated as a woman and vice versa, thereby rendering gender meaningless. The spirit was the utmost importance to the Cathars, immaterial and sexless. Because of this belief, the Cathars saw women as equally capable of being spiritual leaders, which undermined the very concept of gender as held by the Catholic Church. Women accused of being heretics in early medieval Christianity included those labelled Gnostics, Cathars, as well as several other groups that were sometimes tortured and executed. Cathars, like Gnostics, who preceded them, assigned more importance to the role of Mary Mandolin in the spread of early Christianity than the Church previously did. Her vital role as a teacher contributed to the Cathar belief that women could serve as spiritual leaders. Women were found to be included in the perfecti in significant numbers. The Cathars saw Mary Mandolin as perhaps even more important than St. Peter, the founder of the church. The Cathar movement proved successful in gaining female followers because of its proto-feminist teaching along with the general feeling of exclusion from the Catholic Church. Catharicism attracted numerous women with the promise of a leadership role that the Catholic Church did not allow. They let women become a perfect of the faith, a position of far more prestige than anything the Catholic Church offered. The publication of the early scholarship book Crusade Against the Grail by the young German Otto Rahn rekindled interest in the connection between the Cathars and the Holy Grail, especially in Germany. The philosopher and Nazi government official Alfred Rosenberg speaks favourably of the Cathars in the myth of the 20th century. Starting in the 1990s and continuing to the present day, historians like R.I. Moore 
and have radically challenged the extent of which Catharicism as an institutionalised religion actually existed, building on the works of French historians such as Monique Zeno and Uri Broom. Moore's The War on Heresy argues that Catharicism was contrived from the resources of the well-stocked imaginations. In short, Moore claims the men and women persecuted as Cathars were not the followers of a secret religion imported from the East. Instead, they were part of a broader spiritual revival taking place in the, in the later 12th and early 13th century. There is widespread belief that the Knights Templar and the Cathars had similar worldview. What is undeniable is that they shared the fate of being denounced as heretics and violently attacked by, by secular authorities of France. They were subject to arrest, interrogation and torture by the Inquisition and in some cases executed by burning at the stake. Some have claimed, because of some shared Gnostic heritage, the Order of the Temple offered shelter to fugitive Carthers during the papal persecution of the sect which commenced a century before the Templars themselves faced destruction. The Templars in the meantime are supposed to have embraced many Cathar doctrines. The two heretical groups are supposed to have been united additionally by reverence of a particular female saint, Mary Mandolin, and by having some special insight concerning her relationship with Jesus. The Templars were founded to defend pilgrims in territory taken by the First Crusade and were based on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Their primary backer, a Sistine Abbot, secured their recognition as an arm of the Church at the Council of Troyes. He also saw that these warriors, living celebrately and without personal property, the Templars grew quickly. Another religious movement, known to history as the Cathar Heresy, was taking root in southern France at this time. The Cathars were similar to the Templars in their scorn of worldly things and their obsession with chastity. Pope Innocent III ordered the persecution of the Cathars. The ingrained corruption of heresy does not cease to breed monstrous offspring. Let us enforce correction on these vile breed of people. This campaign became known as the Albigen Crusade, after the town of Albi, one of those hotbeds of Catharicism. It must have been difficult as this turned out to be total war. A rash sortie of the defenders left the gate of the city undefended and the rabble of the northern army was able to surge through and hold it open. As the streets filled with blood, many of the people fled to a church in the upper town which was dedicated to Mary Mandolin. The crusaders trapped them there and slaughtered them. In one morning, the town was wiped out Altogether, some 20,000 people, regardless of age and sex. Arnold Armory marked Mary Mandolin's day with the first mass burning of living Cathars.
There may have been genuine fears that as the Templars had operated at the same time as the rise of Catharicism, that they had imbibed some of their philosophy, or that the Templars were influenced by ancient Christian beliefs in the East that were very similar to those held by French heretics. Worse, there may have been an underlying fear that the Templar military might could be used to carve out a Cathar sympathetic state in southern France as the Crusades in the Holy Land crumbled, where might the Templar energy and know-how be expanded. But their ideas persisted. Many agreed with their view that the church should return to traditions of poverty and piety. Their questioning of the Catholic view that the bread in the mass literally becomes the body of Christ continued to be discussed in low whispers before erupting to the surface centuries later in the Protestant Reformation. Many of France's elite had family connecting to the Cathars. It seemed that in spite of the success of Innocent's Crusade, Catharicism still lurked in the dark corners of French society. As you can see the Calvinism symbol, very similar to the Templar symbol, also the Cathar symbol and the Church of England symbol. So this is, in my view, these, this is where it's spread to. I hope you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and make sure to subscribe, thank you very much.